Pet Cemetery is a book that Stephen King thought might be too horrific to publish. Its adaptation in a terrifying film in 1989 further cemented its place among the King canon, and now we have an all-new adaptation. But what about this version of Pet Cemetery sets it apart? For many Stephen King fans, there are non-scary books, there are scary books, and then there's Pet Cemetery. The novel follows the Creed family as they move to rural Maine, so that the patriarch Lewis can take a job as the head of the University of Maine's medical service. Their new house is beside a road frequented by fast, heavy trucks that often claim the lives of local pets. As a result, neighborhood children have established a pet cemetery in the woods, complete with the misspelled sign that makes up the book's title. When his daughter Ellie's cat Church is run over and killed, Lewis and his neighbor Judd Crandall bury the cat near the cemetery. But Church soon returns to the Creed family home. However, something's not right about the resurrected family cat. Jesus, boy, Christ. <coughs> Just as Judd begins to regret bringing the cat back to life, another tragedy strikes the family. The Creed's youngest son, Gage, is hit by another speeding truck, and Lewis, shaken by grief and his new understanding of the pet cemetery, begins to ponder the unthinkable. Technically, the pet cemetery of the novel's title isn't the actual supernatural part of the story. That honor goes to what Judd calls the real cemetery, a burial ground set up at the back of the pet cemetery. That burial ground was built by the local Native American tribe, the Micmacs. When Church dies, Lewis chisels out a hole for him in the burial ground. Judd explains that he once did the same thing with his own dog Spot, who was also never quite the same after coming back. This leads to Judd's lesson for Lewis. Well, sometimes, that is better. The person you put up there ain't the person that comes back. Later in the novel, King reveals that the burial ground was at some point used for bodies partially consumed by cannibals, and that a legendary supernatural creature called the Wendigo has made a home there. Judd says the ground went sour, and now anything buried might come back as a hostile shell of its former self. Of course, none of this stops Lewis after his son is killed. King first conceived of Pet Cemetery when he found himself in a very similar situation to Lewis Creed's. He and his family moved to a rural home near the University of Maine, with a similarly dangerous road and local pet cemetery. His daughter's cat was killed by one of the trucks, and her resulting grief over the incident helped inspire him to ponder what might happen if you could bring a loved one back. As King told Charlie Rose in a 1993 interview, Here's something that we don't talk about. People sometimes have kids who die. There are terrible things that happen, um, and sometimes a child will die young. By the time it finished the novel, King thought Pet Cemetery was simply too dark to publish. He put the novel in a drawer and believed it would never be released to the public in his lifetime. However, the book was ultimately pulled out and submitted to finish out King's contract with his former publisher, Doubleday. It was a success and is still among King's most widely read and celebrated books, made all the more infamous because of King's own misgivings. The 1980s were a particularly fertile time for King's works. Six years after its publication, Pet Cemetery was made into a film with King himself providing the screenplay and insisting that the movie be shot in his home state of Maine. The film was a box office success and has gone on to be revered as one of the best Stephen King adaptations. In 1992, director Mary Lambert returned to direct Pet Cemetery 2, a film following a different family and their horrific experiences with the Micmac burial ground. However, the sequel was not as successful as its predecessor, and King successfully lobbied the studio to have his name removed from the project. Uh -oh. Looks like Daddy got a boo boo. In the years since Lambert's film was released, Pet Cemetery has retained its reputation as one of King's most frightening stories. It's not surprising that someone would eventually want to make an updated film adaptation. Word of a new version of Pet Cemetery first began to bubble up back in 2010, when writer Matthew Greenberg was attached to write the screenplay. Greenberg eventually fell by the wayside and now only has a story credit on the new film. Development on the project stalled a bit until 2013, when director Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, best known for 28 weeks later, was brought on to helm the remake. Fresnadillo also eventually dropped out and development quieted again. Then in 2017, directors Kevin Kolsch and Dennis Widmeyer, the team behind the Hollywood horror film Starry Eyes, were hired to tackle the new adaptation. Though the new film seems to be very much in keeping with the spirit of King's original novel, there's one major change in Pet Cemetery that the filmmakers have already revealed. In the second trailer for the film, it's revealed that the Creed child who's killed and resurrected is the older Ellie, not Toddler Gage. 
The reveal sent a shock through fans expecting another largely faithful adaptation of the book, but the filmmakers have some very good reasons for the change, among them the simple fact that an older and therefore larger child is a bigger threat. Plus, much of the horror in the 1989 film revolving around the resurrected Gage was done with a doll, limiting what the filmmakers could do if they tried to go that route again. As producer Lorenzo de Bonaventura put it, it was an opportunity to show the audience something new. He told Entertainment Weekly, Trust me, we were nervous about it. I feel this way about anything that you remake or update. If we gave you what you had before, we didn't do the subject matter much good. I'm very protective of movies too, but I want a new experience each time, and feel like filmmakers have really thought about the choice. Such a major deviation from Pet Cemetery's original plot is bound to divide fans of both the source material and the original film. On one hand, there are purists who would argue that Gage's death is a natural progression of the story. As the most vulnerable member of the Creed family, his death is the most tragic and his resurrection is therefore the most horrifying. On the other hand, there are fans who are intrigued by the choice and interested in seeing how things take shape. Screenwriter Jeff Bueller admitted that even he took a little while to come around to the idea. I was like, we can't do this, and then once it settles, once that initial Stephen King purist shock settles, and you start thinking about the mechanics of writing the story and how it would feel on film, it all started to feel more and more right. It's impossible to adapt a work like Pet Cemetery and not step on somebody's toes, so we just kind of picked one big toe to step on and just left it at that. So, what did King think of the big change to his story? According to star Jason Clark, Stephen King didn't have an issue with it. Throughout his career, Stephen King has built a fictional universe all his own that expands to connect in ways both small and large, even his most self-contained novels. This is most overt in his Dark Tower saga, which deals with the notion of a multiverse, but even other novels contain these kinds of lateral references. The original Pet Cemetery novel features references to Cujo, Salem's Lot, and It. With the television series Castle Rock throwing out King Easter eggs left and right, it would make sense that the new film would also have its own list of references for King fans to spots. Don't expect them to be too on the nose, though. With Maya told Sci-Fi, some of our art directors were like, how about we have some signage in Ludlow that says, like, Danny Torrance Realty? No, because he wouldn't have a realtor office in Ludlow. Carrie White wouldn't have a prom dress shop because she's dead. Every little Easter egg, and there are a lot of them you probably haven't caught yet, are things that could exist within the world of Ludlow and the story. You can make a very scary, very stylish, and very violent horror film that still comes away with a PG-13 rating. For some filmmakers, that's the way to go, since it can help the box office if teenagers are able to see it. For other filmmakers, though, there's just no substitute for pushing the horror all the way into the rated R territory. For Pet Cemetery, that was always going to be the right path. In some ways, according to Deb on Aventura, it felt like the only path. He told Sci-Fi, Having tussled with the ratings board more than I'd care to admit, when you have a child in jeopardy, which we have throughout this story, you're automatically an R. I'll say it this way also, we've never had a conversation with the studio about it being PG-13. My feeling about rating in general is I think some movies really demand one or the other. In this case, I think you let it be what it is, and so I would tend to want it to be R. Pet Cemetery premiered at South by Southwest this year, making it the second major horror release of 2019, along with Jordan Peele's Us to claim a key spot at one of America's biggest and trendiest film festivals. That means that we can get an immediate answer to the most important new question of all. Is it scary? Well, according to those who saw it at South by Southwest, Pet Cemetery is most definitely a terrifying film. It's freaky as hell. Scared the crap out of me. Megan Navarro of Bloody Disgusting wrote that, There's a level of danger that wasn't present in the 89 adaptation. The changes are such a big departure from the source material that it's quite likely to ruffle feathers of book purists. But it retains the core essence of King's themes and it always works for the better. And the final act is so absolutely off the rails bonkers that it's amazing that a big studio release ever let it pass. It's freaking twisted. You'll get the chance to see how scary the film is for yourself when it arrives in theaters on April 5th. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.